You're listening to Thrive, where every week we have meaningful conversations with incredible women like you, packed with practical tips and sisterly advice to bring you from a life of simply surviving to thriving. We're shaking the story that you're just getting by and stepping into who God made you to be. Because it's not enough to simply survive, you deserve to thrive. I'm your host, Erica Gwynn, and I'm ready to thrive together. Here's today's episode. Hey friends, we are back on Thrive with best-selling author, speaker, Bible teacher, and my friend, Laura Smith. And we're chatting all about her newest book, Holy Care for the Whole Self. It's full of truth and encouragement connecting our mental and spiritual health journeys, and it's going to leave you feeling refreshed and breathing easier in your own earthly walk. But if you have not yet grabbed a copy, no worries, we'll wait and give you some really solid advice and steadfast reminders in the meantime. Especially great if you have ever found yourself struggling mentally and maybe shaming yourself spiritually. You are not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. You don't have to pray away your pain. It is okay and right to seek earthly and heavenly help. Jesus cares about your mental health. And Laura is here to break down the both and of seeking healing. Stay tuned through this episode. Drop it five stars if you like what you're listening to. And now, welcome, Laura. Hey, thanks so much for having me back, Erica. Yay, I'm so happy to have you back on Thrive. To this day, you are truly one of my favorite episodes and just favorite people because you truly Aww. have such a heart of gold. So I'm very appreciative that you are taking the time to come back and hang out with us again. Thank you so much. That means so much to me. Yes, we've got an episode for anyone who may have missed it. It's an episode from last year called Hold Every Thought Captive and Then What? And it's one of my personal favorites because man, oh man, surrendering all the things to God has always been a more difficult practice for me. But we, well, we, I say we, but really it's Laura, breaks down so beautifully. We. Um, yeah. We talk a lot about truly what it means to look at each thought you are having and analyze it and give it, give it what it needs to either grow in a, a good direction or to go in a different direction and be blessed and changed and renewed and all of that good stuff. So we'll link that in the show notes in case you might have missed it. But today we are here to chat about your newest book, Holy Care for the Whole Self, which is such a beautiful breakdown of our mental and spiritual health journeys and how they so beautifully can and do uh, go together. So before we go any further, can you just tell everyone again, who you are for anyone who might have missed the first episode or just needs a lovely refresher of the lovely Laura. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, my name is Laura Smith. I live in Oxford, Ohio, a small college town, home of Miami University. Um, married to my awesome husband, who's a professor here. We have four incredible kiddos who are not littles like yours, but big kids who are awesome and so fun. And I am an author and a speaker and a Bible teacher. This book is my 13th, which is just so crazy to me. And um, I'm just so grateful I get to do this thing I always wanted to do. Yay, lucky number 13, right? Exactly. <laughs> so holy care for the whole self. It really feels like chatting with a dear friend over coffee. I feel like getting these glorious little stories that are kind of behind the scenes, sneak peeks of your life, but then also getting really solid advice and reminders of truth. And I think the important thing here is the truth is that Jesus cares about our mental health and Jesus doesn't stigmatize anyone. So I think somewhere along the way, earthly people and broken humans uh, put this stigma on mental health, maybe making us feel like there is something wrong with us mm -hmm. if we are suffering from something like anxiety or depression or just having a hard go of it and that's just not true right right so the cdc says that over 50 percent of americans will be diagnosed with a mental health disorder in their lifetime and that's diagnosed that doesn't even include all of the people who never like seek help to get diagnosed that means more than half of us, probably more like three fourths of us, or maybe all of us are actually will, or at some point suffer from some mental health issue because we live in a broken world and bad stuff happens to all of us. And um, we have these beautiful, wonderful 
minds and bodies that, um, that don't like it when bad things happen to us. And so we're hurt and we're affected by that as we should be. How awful would it be if we weren't affected when bad things happen? Um, so it's totally normal, actually. Um, it's more than average, actually, to have a mental health struggle. Yeah, which is truly an incredible statistic if you sit back and really think about that. Yeah, And it's one of those things like we hear people say, I think especially maybe in the Christian community where maybe some of this stigma came along is when people are told, oh, well, your faith must just not be strong enough. And that's, that's why you're struggling. Like if you just ask Jesus to heal you, like it'll happen. And that's why you're struggling. Or people will just kind of like throw a, throw a piece of scripture at us where it's like, oh, well, it says, don't be anxious. So like you don't so have don't any right to be anxious. Like just, don't be. <laughs> just turn it off, switch. Right. Like so what, what do you have to say to that? Because I feel like that is something where it's happened a lot, but it is not it, somewhere along the way. It got confused that like, that's how God feels and not how broken humans feel. And that's such an important differentiation to make where like, there are just some people who just don't understand things themselves or might not be in a good place themselves who are like throwing this on people and then they take it on as their burden to bear. Like, oh, you're right. Like, I must just not be strong enough. I must. And it's at the root of that is just, it's lies. Like it's, Absolutely. it's lies yeah. that people end up believing. And then it's not only hurtful to our faith, but it's also just hurtful to ourselves because then we might not be getting the help that we actually need for very right. valid, real, actual issues. Absolutely. No, amen to all of that. So I think we need to backtrack a little bit that like, where some of those verses come from is what God wants for us. So Jesus said, I have come so that you can have an abundant life. Like that's what Jesus wants for us. This abundant, full, awesome life, full of all the fruit of the spirit, joy and love and peace and patience and kindness and self-control. That's Jesus's dream for us because he loves us. Just like if you think of your little kiddos, what you want for them is awesomeness, fullness all the time. Now, also, we live in a broken world and bad stuff happens. So say your daughter falls down and skins her knee. That is not awesomeness for her. You want awesomeness for her. You don't want her to be anxious. You don't want her to be hurt or bleeding or crying, but she is. It still hurts. It's still bleeding. It still needs attention. Um, and it needs physical attention in our real world that we live in. Um I, I like to think of it as an analogy with medical things because, for example, I break my arm. Will I pray for a good doctor to look at it? Yes. Will I pray for quick healing? Absolutely. Um, will I also go see a doctor to set it? Yes. Like, I think I think it would be so foolish. And I think anybody listening uh, of any faith or not faith would be like, oh my gosh, you break your arm. Yes, you go see a doctor. Like that's, that's what you do. Like, you're not going to try to just like have that heal on itself, no matter how strong your faith is. And the same is true of a mental health issue. Again, this is health. And if something is broken or out of whack, um, if there's a chemical imbalance or past trauma or some sort of disorder, um, why not see someone who God has trained with special gifts and training and put them in a specific place where they can get an education to learn about these things and they have experience dealing with these things for them to be able to be like, oh, that's not just a normal break. That's broken in three places and we need to put a pin in and we need, you know, um, and the same with our souls and our minds. If something is out of whack, there are trained professionals who know how to help us. So um, not every mental health issue, we can go through a period where we're just anxious about something or sad about something or we're grieving something briefly that you don't always need to see a mental health professional, but I am a giant, giant proponent that everyone should see a counselor. Um, God has created these people in his image and given them a passion to help others. And why would we not take advantage of their knowledge and their desire to help heal us? Yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head in that so much of this is a both and, which is like, part of the mystery of it all, but also part of the gift of it all. Like we can pr both pray for physical healing and go to the doctor. We can pr both pray for mental healing and see the counselor, see a therapist. And you're right. I mean, Jesus puts these people in our paths and puts tools in our toolbox to equip us 
along the way of this Absolutely. whole earthly walk. So it may not be like the face of God himself that we are seeing in our struggle, but I think someone he's gifted people along the way to be the hands of Jesus. Like that is Absolutely. kind of like our role to each of us in earth is like being put in people's paths to make their day better or make their day worse. And every, yeah. it, with every choice that you have there, it's like, that's kind of how we are being the hands and feet of of Jesus on earth, right? You know, like. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. He's gifted us all to do different things for sure. And uh, one of those things is mental health professionals. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, seriously, that there are people who can talk to you for a few minutes. Well, so we, we went just for our annual like doctor checkups for our insurance purposes. We have to go every year. We went this week. And um, I said something about how my hands have been falling asleep at night. It's so weird. Like I've been falling asleep and my hands like, you know, get all that tingly. And I wake up in the middle of the night and I told my doctor that and she just started laughing. She's like, you have carpal tunnel. I was like, what? Like, I, I don't have any pain. I don't, she's like, that is the first sign of carpal tunnel. I'm like, it makes sense. I'm a writer. But she knew because she's trained that because my hands fall asleep at night that I have carpal tunnel. And in the same way, when you go see a counselor or a mental health professional, they can say like, oh, you're having nightmares. I bet you have past trauma. And you're like, what? I just thought everyone had nightmares. Um, they, they, they can see things in us that we can't see because they're trained um, and can give us tools on how to start healing, which yeah. we want and Jesus wants for us. They also can look at things from more of that third party perspective, that kind of zoomed out lens and the yes. bird's eye view. Because yes. I think when we're in the middle of our own messes, it is so hard to do that. And we have that tunnel vision and we just see such a limited scope. And it's right. like God sees the full scope of our entire life and all of existence all at the same time. But then we've got like zoom in a little bit more. And then we have those people who are like our helpers on earth who can see, okay, put the pieces together that we're seeing on the on the table and kind of start to make sense of a picture that we were so zoomed in on that we just were not able to start piecing together without a little bit of, a little bit of assistance. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Before we go any further too, can you give everyone kind of the, the big, the higher level rundown of your book? Because obviously we're kind of diving into the nitty gritty of mental health within it, but give us kind of like the heart behind it and what your hope is for it. Sure. Um, I think the heart behind it is just to let everyone know that Jesus does care so much about our mental health. Um, Jesus created us in his very image. Um, he says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in Psalm 139, 14, that we are his masterpieces in Ephesians 2, 10. Um, God sent Jesus to the world because he loves us. That's why he came. There's so much love for us. And we are these precious masterpieces to Jesus that he cares so much about every detail of us. Even the hairs on our head are numbered. So of course, if something is off with our mental health, he cares about that. He grieves with us. He loves us. He wants perfect healing for us. Um, I want everyone to know that if they don't hear anything else from this podcast, if they don't get anything else from the book, I want them to know that Jesus loves them and sees them where they are and cares about them and is with them in their struggle. And his dream for them is perfect healing. Um, I think that's just so important that we hold on to and that these things aren't separate. We don't have to hide our mental health issues from Jesus. He knows and he cares. Um, so that is, that is the main overall crux. I wrote it because I went on my own mental health journey and I just learned so much about, about Jesus's love for us and literally how the Bible has all these beautiful instructions in it that are actually what mental health professionals are saying now are like the best tips and tricks to care for your mental health. I'm like, wait, that's in the Bible. And oh, that's in the Bible. And that's in the Bible too. And that makes so much sense because God loves us so much. Of course, he would put these instructions in the Bible that would care for us because he wants perfect healing for us. It just, it just made so much sense. And it was something I learned on my journey. Um, also a really fun thing I did in this book that I haven't done in any of the other books I've written is I interviewed over a dozen friends um, who have all been on their own mental health journeys, as well as some Christian mental health professionals to just kind of give a bigger story um, 
as we were saying a minute ago, over 50% of people will be diagnosed with a mental health issue. So I certainly have my journey, but you have yours and the people listening each have theirs. And I thought if I could talk to some friends and kind of just get a broader perspective on some of the different struggles people have had and different things that have worked and haven't worked that I could actually tell a better story. Um, so that was a really fun thing I did in this book that I really think um, gave it more fullness. I also love that you did that because I think you're right. Like we, even when we're reading about mental health or thinking about it, I think we, it's obviously colored by our own experiences and by our own perspectives and all of that. So even just to be able to have somebody else's life perspective kind of in next two hours or adjacent to it, where you can kind of connect, start to connect the dots. I think sometimes it goes back to like the third party perspective when you're seeing it almost like as the outsider and you're seeing what someone else went through, then you can, it's easier to connect the dots and be like, okay, I could see how that would have led to that would have led to that would have led to that. And then we're able to apply that onto our own lives and then go, okay, maybe something connects in my story too. And maybe something in my past has now impacted how I'm thinking in my present and needs some, some adjustments so I can move healthily into my, my future and my next steps. And it just, it just makes it, it also helps us not feel alone because I yeah. think it can be such an isolating thing that, and, and like you said, like we can carry some shame with it and Jesus isn't putting any shame on us, but then we can start to kind of shame ourselves when we feel isolated or we feel like, oh, something must be wrong with me, or I must be the only one who's going through this and being able to kind of see other women boldly share their stories and be vulnerable and open up about their struggles. It just gives everyone else a permission slip to do the same. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly hope so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, one of the chapters in there is about my, both my grandmothers and the time when they were struggling with their mental health, how literally no one talked about it. And I didn't know them at that time. And I never knew one of my grandmothers and I just can't imagine how lonely and hard that was. Um, but we live in a day and age where mental health is being talked about a lot more, um, not as much in the Christian realm, which we totally should be, um, but just more in society. And so, yes, we need to share our stories, um, one, to shine some light on what's going on in our lives um, and help us heal, but also so we can help the people around us heal too, because we'll start to find out that none of us are alone. Yeah. Something you share about in your book too, that I really love is the importance of naming our struggle specifically. Mm -hmm. And we know, okay, God was big on names. It was one of the first to-dos that he gave, passed out in the Garden of Eden here. Yep. But I love this here too, because I think it stresses the importance of identifying it and not identifying as it, because yes. that's something where we can start to kind of internalize and become our, our blank, our diagnosis becomes what we are in some way, right. not intentionally, but like somewhere along the line, we start identifying um, as that. So can you kind of shed some light on, on that and kind of just what, what that looks like, uh, to you in practice? Sure. So I think, you know, again, we can use the medical analogy because I think it's so easy to, for us to wrap our brains around that, but say again, say you've hurt your ankle and if you've sprained your ankle or you've broken your ankle or you've rolled your ankle, you're going to do different things. Um, for all of those, you need to know what that diagnosis is so you can treat it correctly. And that's the same with our mental health issues. Like, because I have PTSD, there are certain things that trigger me. There are certain things that are helpful for me um, that will be different from someone who's struggling with an eating disorder, right? They'll have different things that will trigger them and different things that would be helpful to them. And some of those things might be the same, but some of them will be very specific to the mental health issue we're struggling with. Um so it's very important to have that name. So we know what we're dealing with and how to heal with it. Just like any kind of medical condition, you want to know what medication you should take, right? And you need to know what you have before you can deal with it. Um, but also if I have COVID, I'm not COVID. I'm still Laura. In fact, who I really am is a child of God. Um, and that is our first name and our first most important identity we need to hold on to. Yeah, I could have COVID and know that I need to quarantine and know that I need to rest and know that I need to drink fluids. That's important to know, to care for that ailment I have. But also I can't say I am COVID and think of myself as this dreaded disease that everyone wants to stay away from and um, virus, not disease. But um, I, I think we need to really hold those names of our ailments so 
um, tenderly um, to know that this is something that we are struggling with. And this is a name that helps us get the treatment we need. And also it's not who we are. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's, it's so good because we, we end up, I think, especially for things like that you maybe have been dealing with for a long time or haven't necessarily talked about, it's so easy to kind of fall into the trap of being like, oh, I am my anxiety or I, what something that you just kind of hinted at is like, we then think we kind of apply that to how others relate to us. Or we make assumptions like, oh, they're not going to want to hang out with me because I am anxious or I am depressed or I am. And we just, it just kind of feeds into those feelings of isolation. And I just, I can't help but always think like, that is just what the devil wants. Like he just wants us to feel alone and wants us to feel Mm -hmm. like nobody cares about us and wants us to feel like we are broken and we are past being helped and there is just no hope for us and it will always be this way and everything sucks and it's just this totally awful negative downward spiral and that is where he wants us to be and it's like he wants you to feel like there's no hope for you and that god did this to you and that you are wrong and you are broken and there's just like so much attack that happens there And it's just not, it doesn't have, it's just not true. It's just not true. It's not true at all. In fact, like we see just even what you're just saying, like in the Bible, there is somebody who is blind and the people are asking Jesus, well, is it because this dude sinned? Is that why he's blind? Or is it because his parents sinned? like, who messed up here to make this happen? Which we could say about our mental health too. Was it, was it my parents or was it me? Like, how did this happen to me? Right. And Jesus is like, neither, like, it's it's not about sin. And then he heals that man from blindness because again, what God wants for us is perfect healing. Um, so that's Jesus's desire. And we see all these people who are alone and desperate and in their worst ways. And Jesus continues to find them and turn to them. So no, like if we're in pain and alone, it's not like, oh, we should just stay by ourselves and we shouldn't tell anyone. That's not how it works when you actually see how Jesus treated people, like the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, like she is so ashamed. She has been at that time, if you were bleeding at all, and this, she's actually had her period for 12 years. So I can't imagine how awful that would have been. But if you were bleeding at all, you had to quarantine, isolate, because you were considered unclean. So for 12 years, she's been in quarantine. I can't imagine how lonely and ostracized she felt. So she has to kind of sneak out to touch Jesus. Like she could get in so much trouble legally, religiously for being out in public. But as soon as she touches him, what does she want to do? She wants to run away and hide. She knows she can get healed by him, but she doesn't want, she feels so much shame. And instead he stops everything, giant crowd. He's on his way to actually bring someone else to life. Like he's on big business, but he stops everything. And he says, daughter, he calls her daughter because that's who she is. She's been ostracized by, by society, but She is his daughter. We are his daughters and sons. We are children of the one true king. And that's what he wanted her to know most. So when we feel alone and when we feel like no one wants to be around us because of our ailment, because of what we're struggling with, Jesus stops everything. He says, no, no, that's not who you are. You're my beloved. I love you. Yes, the rest is all lies, but Jesus comes to the people who Again and again, the Samaritan woman at the well, alone by herself, he comes to her. His disciples are like, why are you talking to her? He's like, I have business here. Um, The woman who got caught in adultery and where the dude was, I don't know why he wasn't thrown out there too with her, but um, she is naked in a crowd. I can't imagine like speaking of shame or not wanting anyone to see you or wanting to just hide And he literally protects her. He stands between her and the crowd. And he does not condemn her at all. He says, did they not have any problem with you? You know, me, they're just, just, you know, he protects her. He he could have been like, what were you doing? And what, you know, all the things I think we shout in our own head, like, why did I do that? And I can't believe I act like that. And I wish I didn't act like that. Jesus never says that to us. He protects us and he loves us and he comes to us and he reminds us who we are. Yeah. On a um, unrelated but related and just lighter note, 
what is skyline dip? Because you talk about this in your book <laughs> and I promise there's like a legitimate transition coming here. But first <laughs> the people need to know, I need to know what is skyline dip because it sounds delicious from the book. I'm sure everyone who picks up a copy and reads it, you'll probably have the same thought where you're like, whoa, hook a sister up because this sounds legit. That's so funny. I will have to definitely post a Skyline Dip recipe. <laughs> um, so Skyline Dip, we live um, just outside of Cincinnati and there's this thing called Cincinnati Chili. Um, and okay. Skyline is the biggest, like the the kind of icon of Cincinnati Chili. And it's not chili like you know it. It's um, it's put on conies, it's put on french fries, it's put on spaghetti. Um, it's a whole thing. You'll have to look up Skyline Chili. Um, it's a whole like brand and a whole thing. And people who move away from Cincinnati, like order cases of the cans of Skyline Chili, like to where they live. It's like this whole thing. Um, Skyline Dip is a layer of cream cheese, a can okay, so of a Skyline start. Chili. Yeah. Cream cheese, a can of Skyline Chili, and then as much cheddar cheese as you want to put on the top and you heat it up and you dip Fritos in it. Um, so it's all of this sweet, I mean, all the crunchy, salty gooey stuff you can think of I personally don't like it <laughs> and I think I even say that in the book but my family does and I have never taken it somewhere where it had like the platter hasn't been licked clean so it is definitely a fan favorite in southwest Ohio yeah and okay it's about that... one second to make also yeah which makes it a fan favorite for me I would definitely be a fan favorite of that now I ask about that because in your book obviously you talk about having one or two kind of go-to recipes that are memorized for those spur of the moment situations where you have to take a plate. So if it's like a kiddo's last minute request for school, or you have like a spontaneous girls night or a community potluck, what have you, and you need something to bring really quick, no fail. You could just whip this out, whip out the ingredients, make it happen and go. Similarly, we need kind of like those go-to pieces of scripture that we have memorized, that we have in our back pocket for when we find ourselves in those darker moments, whether that's the moment of isolation where we're kind of in a shame spiral or we're in the middle of a panic attack or just kind of experiencing like a wave of depression, just going into some sort of unhealthy tailspin direction. So what is kind of like your favorite way to find those battle verses that really speak to you personally, because I love that you mentioned that in the book, that it's not like there are just these few chosen highlighted pieces of scripture that are like the ones for everybody to rinse and repeat in those moments, but that it's really kind of this personal thing based on your own story and your own experiences. And it's how God speaks to you personally through his work and his words. So yeah, what is, what's kind of your recommendation there for you got the whole Bible in front of you. Where do you start for finding what's going to be like your own pieces of scripture to take with you into those moments? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think part of that even goes back to knowing what our core issues are. Um, and I guess so even if you don't know your core issue, if you just know that you feel on edge or unsettled or down, um, the Bible is 66 books. And I don't know, mine here in front of me is like 3000 pages. So where do you find your best things there? I, um, I think it's from daily time with the Lord, honestly. And when you are reading and something pops out to you or hits home with you, underline it, write it in your journal, um, look it up in a couple different translations, put it on a note card, make it your screensaver, um, do something with the verses that stand out to you and then start a collection of them. Um, if you don't know where to start at all, like if you haven't ever read the Bible or you're just like curious about this, um, the Psalms are a beautiful place to start because the Psalms are actually this, like it's a song book and, you know, song lyrics are always so great. Like, you know how they give us all the feels and we can uh, like relate to those in our times of trouble. And so same with the Psalms and the Psalmists are literally experiencing every emotion. Um, there are Psalmists who are angry and terrified and anxious and, um, and also who are elated and joyful and thankful. So I think it's just a beautiful place to start because like Psalm 16 is there's that whole thing helps me so much when I'm struggling, but there's a line in there that says the boundary lines have been drawn for me in pleasant places. And I don't know when I'm in a like really scary thing. I'm like, I don't know what to do. And it's like, oh, God has these boundary lines around me and he's keeping me safe. 
and he wants me to be safe. That to me just brings me so peace. Just even to say it out loud, it's like, oh, the boundary lines have been drawn for me. I'm glad something happens. That calms my soul. That might not calm your soul. If it doesn't, that's fine. But like you have to read um, Psalm 139 is beautiful. Um, it talks that we already said about, I'm fearfully, wonderfully made. Like it reminds us who we are, that when we were still in our mother's womb, that God created us so intentionally and specifically, but it goes on to say like near the end of it, it's like, test, test me, Lord. And what does it say? It says, search me, oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Okay. Um, when you don't, when your anxious thoughts are spiraling, like God, know these, please know these, like, you know, what's going on. Like, um, it also says you go before me, you go behind me, you keep your hand on me. That to me is so beautiful. Like no matter what we're facing, God is in front of us in there. He knows what's going to happen. He's there. He's like our front line. He's also got our back, which sometimes it feels like we don't have anyone, but he does. And his hand is on us. So no matter what seems to be spiraling crazy out of control, like God is with us. So the Psalms anyway, rambling Psalms are a great place. Um, to me, the letters of Paul are also a great place because they actually talk a lot about what Jesus wants for us. There are letters to the early church saying like, what, now that you know Jesus, like what his desires are for us. So there's a lot of reminders there about there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus and um, that we are Christ's masterpieces. And they're just like true facts about um, what Jesus wants for us that are super helpful too. Those would be my, you know, some go-to places, but it's going to take your that. own personal journey. You're going to have to read it. You're going to have to do the work. Yeah. I also love, well, here's a, a rule that I'm stealing from you that you put in the book, um, setting a timer for 10 minutes every day to pray without peeking at the timer, just praying, just letting it be a conversation with you and God. Um, because I feel like when we do feel super isolated or super disconnected, obviously our mental health isn't helped by that, but we also often feel disconnected from God when we're not putting in the time ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if you're sitting there and you're thinking like, I don't know, I don't really feel God. I feel disconnected. I just feel it's not God that pulled away from you. Right. <laughs> like, right. I feel like Never that's does. kind of the hard truth, right? That's kind of like the hard truth that a lot of us need to hear sometimes myself included when I'm in those moments. And then I, you, you just have to take a step back and go, well, when was the last time that I really just talked to him? Mm -hmm. Like, not just reciting something in my head or just like what, but just really just sat and talked like to a friend. Like if you were, if you were, if you hadn't talked to a girlfriend in a while, okay. Yeah. The first time you talk to her again, it might feel a little awkward. You might not be sure quite really of where to start. It doesn't jump in just as easily and effortlessly. It's going to take some warming up. And I'm like, I feel like the same thing happens with our relationship with God sometimes, but it's because of us. And it's like, he's sitting there waiting, like, Hello, glad to have you back. Like sitting, waiting here Always. the whole time for you. Always. But, so you just have to like, let yourself get back into it and know that he's going to be waiting there. Like, Hey, missed you. Like here for you. Yep. Still, ha yep. still hanging out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, he promises to never leave us. So that means he's always there. In fact, the Holy Spirit lives within us if you're a follower of Jesus. So he's literally inside of us. Like you can't get away from him, which is a great thing. But yes, it's just like you said, any relationship, you need to take the time for it too. And if you don't know, if you're feeling really disconnected from God, or if you don't know God at all, um, or if you just feel like you are in such a dark place that you, you're you like, God, how can you even be in this? Like you can start that prayer time just being like, God, where are you? What do you think of me? Um, And it's wild. Like, gosh, I'm tearing up. You say, God, where are you? He's like, I'm right here. You say, what do you think of me? Like when he'll say, I love you. Um, you just ask him some quick, direct questions. The psalmists aren't afraid to say like, what's going on? Where are you? Why is it taking so long? What is, you know, ask him really what's on your mind. He wants to hear all that. You don't have to have these like fancy words or you don't have to be like, oh God, you're so great. Even though I'm, you know, in a very terrible bout of depression, depression, like you can say this stinks. Where are you? I need you. And if you pause to let him answer you, you will be filled with love. Yeah. I think that's usually really overwhelming. Like those moments where I've experienced that personally, it's, it's like, you're not really expecting to have the response back that you do get because chances are, I think if you've been in kind of a more negative place, maybe you have felt more disconnected and whatever. And if you let yourself have kind of that vulnerable moment and he shows up and you really feel it, you're like, holy crap, 
God Dang. just answered me. Like, <laughs> like it's a, it could be, and it's not like you necessarily, maybe you'll hear like a word, may, you know, that's cool when that happens or you'll see a, God will speak to you in a way where like, you just know, like, you know, in your heart that that was not your own brain putting that thought there, mm-hmm. which is what's so cool when you're mm-hmm. like, wow, I just had like the God of the whole universe, just like came down to say something to me specifically, like me, little old me in my, in my crying on the bathroom floor he just came down and met me here like wow that's really cool and those I think those moments also help really make you feel more connected and deep in your faith because it just makes you feel so seen Mm -hmm. in moments where even the people on earth who know you and love you the most may still be missing it and they might not still see it and like God will come and be like you know what I don't even care that you haven't that I haven't heard from you in a hot second I still know you and love you more than anybody else here and that is something it sure is It sure is. It's so beautiful. Yeah. How do you kind of besides, well, how do you in general invite the Lord into your messiest moments? What are some of like, I know you just kind of mentioned some of the quick, short, easy prayers, but do you have any other kind of easy, I don't want to say prompts because that feels a little more formal, but I feel I'm someone who like is a very visual learner and likes having examples of things. And I'm sure some folks listening might feel the same where like, if you got to give people, okay, here's a couple of quick, easy ways to just invite the Lord into wherever you are on your mental health journey, in your messy moments, in whatever moment you need. Do you have any sort of like favorites or go-to, go-to starters? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Starting prompts. Well, I think, you know, like we just talked about, he is always there. So do we actually want to invite him into our mess or not is our decision because he loves us so much. He gives us free will. So I can mm. know that I am struggling with something and I can hold on tight to it because I want to control it and I want to go this way and I don't take time to talk to God because I have this I want to do and I want to tell that person off and I want to like, you know, or I can say, okay, God, I am so tied up in knots. I need you. So I think it's a very conscious decision that who do we want to actually handle our problems? Do we want God to step mm. in and help us or do we want to be in control? Um Because the truth is he's way more equipped to handle everything and anything since he can like actually like create the world Um, that, (laughs) um, (laughs) for example, um, that um, it's that release to him. So some of those things that kind of show that release is starting my day with God, like starting my day in scripture. There's a million things I could do any morning to start my day but to start my day in scripture. And you guys, just for the record, that doesn't mean like before I get out of bed. For me, that means getting my high school son out the door, fed vitamins for our family, breakfast in front of me because I wake up starving every day. Um, You know, sometimes I even have to send an email first or a text to my daughter who's in college first. But before I start working for the day, before I open my laptop, I'm going to spend time in the Bible. And that to me is, it is an act of surrender that God, you are more important than my agenda today. And whatever I'm going to face and whatever struggles that may or may not cause me, if I spend some time in my Bible first, I'm going to find those verses that ring true for me. I'm going to find reminders of who you are and how you love me and how you're always there for me and how you protect me and how your will is perfect and how you withhold no good thing from me. And like to set my mind on those things first help set the whole rest of the day. Again, prayer, like we just talked about for me, I try to do that in the middle of the day as a reset. Like I started my day in the Bible, but come two o'clock in the afternoon, 10 million and eight things have happened. Um, I may or may not be doing as well. And if I set that timer and spend some time in prayer, that's that reset um, to give God control again and remind him. And the more we do these things, the more we get in the habit of it. So I haven't perfected this. I don't think any of us will ever until we get to heaven. But the more we turn to God when we have a problem, the more we'll turn to God when we have a problem. And the more we listen for his voice, the more we'll hear his voice. And the more we look for his goodness, the more we'll see his goodness. Um, So I think all of those things, um, practicing gratitude is an awesome one instead of being like, so I was sick this last week and I just kept being like, God, you are so good. Like you made my body work that it's getting this virus out. You give me a bed that I can rest in and a soft pillow for my head and a husband who's so sweet that he bought me chicken soup. Like, um, I think focusing on that instead of like, oh, I can't believe I feel crummy. You know, it just changes everything. And again, that's giving glory to God for who he is and what he's done. And it 
it changes our mindset and helps us out of the hard stuff. So I would like to say it's like a quick fix. Here's these three things you do that just like makes you more connected to God and more in sync with him. But it's it actually takes intentionality and it takes some surrender that you're actually going to say, um, you are the Lord of my life. And I mean, you you made me and the people around me and you know everything I'm going through. So I'm going to I'm going to give you some of my time. Yeah. Well, it's like any relationship. There's no three. There's no three steps to mastering your marriage like right it's something sure. that takes work for your entire life even in the best of relationships so sure. don't be afraid of the work absolutely absolutely before we wrap up this thought just came to me so I feel like maybe someone needs to hear it or whatever but what do you do or say when maybe the when you are kind of living in this both and where you're okay you are seeing doctors to help with your physical healing therapists to help with your mental healing and you are given a diagnosis or you're given instructions or something and you feel a disconnect between what these experts on earth are telling you and what you feel in your heart maybe God is telling you or maybe like maybe you feel the disconnect maybe somebody else mentions they feel a disconnect or just something feels off where there's like not necessarily alignment between your earthly helping healers and your heavenly healer, how do you kind of come to terms with that and figure out your next steps or who to, who to trust most, or when it's time to get a second opinion or switch and find a new person entirely, because you're just not, it's just something's not quite right. No, that's a really, really good question. I think that first part of it's actually really good to recognize. Sometimes it's just really not right. Um, you might have to do the work of trying three different therapists before you find one that works for you. And they'll be like, oh, I tried a therapist and it didn't work. So I'm not doing therapy, right? Like, again, if we want healing, we need to take the steps towards healing. And um, I think prayer again and reading the Bible are the best things to hear God's voice. So the more we talk to him and the more we read his words, the more we'll hear his voice and the more we'll know if something is off. And I think you do kind of get that gut feeling like this doesn't feel like something Jesus says or something that aligns with the truths that I'm reading in my Bible. Or so if you start to feel that way, I would one, pray about it. Um, and two, talk to a couple really trusted Christian friends, um, whether that's a spouse or your best girlfriend or a woman from Bible study, or, um, you know, it could be your mom. I don't know like who in your life you really trust. Um, because you have to trust them enough to share your mental health situation with them. And um, you want them to be shared in the faith so that they understand that. And God literally gives us community to give us wisdom. And he puts people around us to help us. We're not supposed to do it on our own. In fact, you know, God says from the get-go, it is not good for man to be alone. He says that because it's not good for us to be alone. Um, so I would ask a couple of really close people you care about and ask them to be praying for you in the decision as well. Um, and give yourself a little bit of time before you act. Like if a doctor tells you to go on a medication that's not working for you or to do some practices that you feel like are counteractive to your faith, like maybe being unkind to someone as who's being unkind to you. Like, you know, Jesus doesn't ask us to be unkind. Um, we are supposed to set boundaries to keep ourselves safe because Jesus wants to keep us safe. But if, if an action just feels out of line with who you think God has created you to be or who, how he wants us to act, then step back, pray about it. Talk to a couple people you trust, ask them to pray about it. Give yourself a week or two to like process and keep reading the Bible every day. And when you open your Bible, say, Jesus, please show me like the answers here. And in your prayer time every day, just be like, God, I need help knowing what to do here. And he loves you so much. He's going to show you. And it'll be wild. It'll be like through a worship song you hear. You'll be like, oh, that just totally makes sense. Or it'll be like, you know, maybe a book that you're reading or a podcast you listen to, like maybe this one. Um, and you'll be wondering and all of a sudden you'll be like, oh, and that is God's answer to prayer. Don't think it has to be in your prayer time or in the Bible, although those are great ways that he answers prayers. It could be through the friend you asked. Um, it could be through a Disney movie you watch. You'll be like, oh my gosh, like watch Tangled for a second. You'll see gaslighting full on. And um, you'll be like, oh my gosh, that's how that person treats me. I shouldn't be with them, right? Like um, you never know what God is going to use to speak to you. But if you're talking to him, he will help direct your steps. He promises to direct our steps. Yeah. So good. So true. 
Well, in getting things all wrapped up, I know you answered this last time you were here, but I'm curious if your answer has changed at all because I feel like in all 150 plus episodes of Thrive, we've never had the same answer twice. And I don't remember what you said the last time. I don't even know what you're going to ask. (laughs) It's what does Thrive mean to you and how do you strive to thrive in your everyday life? Mm, What does Thrive mean to me? Thrive means to me... um, it means living the life that Jesus has called me to. And right now, I would say that that means not comparing myself to anybody else, but fully trusting and believing that he has given me what he has for me. And that is so awesome. And he's given you, Erica, what he has for you. And that is so awesome. And everyone who's listening, like he's put you in certain places with certain people, with certain passions because he wants you to thrive in those things that you love. If you love music or baking or being outside, like he wants you to thrive in all those things and not look left or right or at the girl on Instagram and be like, oh my gosh, she has blah, blah, blah. Um, Because the Bible does tell us that God will withhold no good thing from us. So if there's something good for me, he's not going to keep it from me. So I think thriving for me right now just really means living in the goodness God has for me and not comparing myself to the goodness he has for anyone else, because that, as it turns out, wouldn't actually be the best thing for me. Yeah. So good. So good. Tell everybody where they can find you online to connect with you more. And also of course, where they can grab a copy of Holy Care for the Whole Self. Absolutely. So my website is laurasmithauthor.com. Um, and on Instagram, it's also Laura Smith author. And those are the best ways to find me and all kinds of free resources and blogs and my other books and all that good stuff. Um, Holy care for the whole self is on Amazon and every other online digital bookseller. Um, it's published by our daily bread publishing. So it's on their website as well. And, um, you could go into your local bookstore because I love local bookstores, um, support them and ask for them to get you a copy. If they don't have it, they can get you one. So that's where you can find it. Awesome. Wait, before you go, make sure you're subscribed to never miss an episode of Thrive. Drop five stars on your way out if you like what you just listened to. And come join the party on Instagram at thrive.podcast to stay inspired and thriving all week long. Thanks for tuning in. It's your time to thrive.